Let's now look at scenario number two. This time, the sympathetic postganglionic axons are innervating structures found in the thoracic cavity, your heart and your lungs, and it will leave through the sympathetic nerves. So we're going to focus in on T1 to L2. I'll highlight the lateral gray horns and as well as the white ramus. After all, we're talking about the thoracolumbar division, the sympathetic division. Now, one thing to keep in mind, if we're going to the heart and the lungs, part of that will be found between T1 to L2, while the other part will be found above T1. Is this going to be a problem? No, because we have the sympathetic chain. So let's begin with my sympathetic preganglionic neurons cell body located at the lateral gray horn. Its axon is gonna leave through the ventral root and will always enter the white ramus, whereby it's going to synapse with the sympathetic postganglionic neuron. And here it is. And again, this is happening at the sympathetic chain ganglion. And its axon is not going to leave through the gray ramus. Instead, it's going to leave right here. Okay, so this is again going to heart and lungs. So let me write heart, lungs. So we're clear as far as the effectors. So we are now going to refer to this as the sympathetic nerve. So within the sympathetic nerve, going to the heart and the lungs, we are going to find the axon of the sympathetic postganglionic neuron. If we're going to heart and lungs, part of that is going to involve areas above T1. So let me draw another sympathetic preganglionic cell body at the lateral gray horn. Its axon is going to leave through the ventral root. It will enter the white ramus and up the chain it goes, where now it's going to synapse with the postganglionic neuron. And where is this postganglionic neuron's axon going? Well, it's going to leave right here and innervating, once again, the heart and the lungs. And we are going to refer to this as, once again, the sympathetic nerve. Now, if you notice, gray ramus is not involved, nor are the dorsal or ventra rami, not unless we are going to structures associated with the skin. Now, before we move on to scenario number three, I just want to point out that below L2 will not apply. So it will strictly be within T1 to L2 and above T1. Now, in case you're wondering what this sympathetic chain ganglion would be, it'll be one of those cervical ganglia. So for scenario number three, we are now going to consider the sympathetic postganglionic axons that innervate structures found in the head. And these postganglionic axons will leave through the cephalic periarterial nerves. Some of the structures found in the head would include the lacrimal glands, which produces tears, the salivary glands that produces saliva, the nasal mucosa, the lining of our nasal cavity, the pineal gland, and as well as the dilator pupillae that we find in the iris. So as far as the structures in the head, we are going to be focusing above T1. And I'm going to highlight the lateral gray horn and as well as the white ramus. So let's draw the cell body of my sympathetic preganglionic neuron found in the lateral gray horn. The axon leaves through the ventral root, always enters the white ramus. Since we are innervating structures in the head, this axon has to go up the chain. So it will be above T1. It will synapse with a sympathetic postganglionic neuron and its axon will leave right here. And it's going to, once again, structures found in the head, such as your dilator pupillae. Now, what do we call this? We are going to refer to this as the cephalic periarterial nerve. 
not the sympathetic nerves, because we're not going through the heart and lungs, not the spinal nerves, because we're not going to structures associated with the skin. As far as this ganglion, this would be one of those cervical ganglia that we find above T1. And once again, the gray ramus, nor do the dorsal or ventral rami, will apply in this scenario. So we're now done looking at the synapsing between the sympathetic preganglionic neuron and the sympathetic postganglionic neuron at a sympathetic chain ganglion. What we're now going to consider is when they synapse at the collateral ganglia, which we also refer to as the prevertebral ganglia. The bottom line is this will apply for structures below the diaphragm. So in other words, structures in the abdominal pelvic cavity. So here is your diaphragm. So we're looking at the region below the diaphragm. After all, there's more than just skin, more than the organs in the thoracic cavity, the heart and the lungs, and as well as structures found in the head. What about the organs found below the diaphragm or inferior to the diaphragm, the liver, the stomach, the kidneys? So you'll see that the sympathetic preganglionic axon will pass through that sympathetic chain ganglion and will eventually reach a collateral ganglia whereby it will now synapse with a sympathetic postganglionic neuron. I'd like you to memorize these splantic nerves. This is where we are going to find the axon of the sympathetic preganglionic neuron. I'd also like you to memorize the collateral ganglia where the actual synapsing between the pre and the postganglionic neurons occur. Cilia ganglia, we have two, that's why it's ganglia. We have one superior mesenteric ganglion, one inferior mesenteric ganglion, and one hypogastric ganglion. So let's now go ahead and diagram scenario number four. So for scenario number four, we are innervating structures in the abdominal pelvic cavity. So once again, I'll highlight the lateral gray horn found in spinal cord segments T1 to L2 and as well as the white ramus. So let's draw my cell body of my sympathetic preganglionic neuron that's found in the lateral gray horn. Now, one thing I want to mention before I proceed any further, as far as innervating these structures, what will apply will be T1 to L2 and below L2. However, above T1 will not apply. So once again, here is the cell body found in the lateral gray horn, and its axon will leave the ventral root and will always enter the white ramus. Now, it will not synapse at the sympathetic chain ganglion. Instead, the sympathetic preganglionic neuron's axon will continue on. So it's going to pass that sympathetic chain ganglion and will enter the collateral ganglion. And this is where it will now synapse with the sympathetic postganglionic neuron. And its axon will now innervate structures in the abdominal pelvic cavity. What we are now going to refer to this right over here, this is now referred to as a splantic nerve. And we are going to call this structure a collateral ganglion. So are we expecting to find the cell bodies of the sympathetic postganglionic neurons in this collateral ganglion? Yes, we will. Just like what we would find in the sympathetic chain ganglion. But we're not done because since we're looking at structures in the abdominal pelvic cavity, below L2 will apply as well. Let me quickly draw the cell body of another sympathetic preganglionic neuron and its cell body located in the lateral gray horn. Out the axon goes through the ventral root, enters the white ramus, down the chain it goes, passes the sympathetic chain ganglion, continues on, and enters the collateral ganglion. And now it will synapse 
with a sympathetic postganglionic neuron, and this axon will leave innervating the structures found in the abdominal pelvic cavity. So what are we going to call this ganglion where the synapsing has occurred? Well, this is going to be another collateral ganglion. And what do we call the structure in which we find the sympathetic preganglionic neurons axon as? Well, this is another splantic nerve. So splantic nerve. I'm just going to abbreviate it. And I've listed these splantic nerves. The greater splantic nerve, the lesser splantic nerve, the lumbar splantic nerve, and the sacral splantic nerve. So will these splantic nerves innervate abdominal pelvic cavity organs? The answer is yes. Will they innervate structures found in the head? No, they won't. Will they innervate structures found in the skin? No. And of course, we have the collateral ganglia where the synapsing occurs. The celiac, the superior mesenteric, the inferior mesenteric, and the hypogastric ganglia. Now, are we going to find the cell bodies of the sympathetic postganglionic neuron that innervates skin, will we find it in this collateral ganglia? No, we won't. Then what do we find in this collateral ganglia? Well, what we're going to find is the sympathetic postganglionic neuron's cell body that innervates abdominal pelvic organs. So what we're now going to look at is synapsing that occurs at the adrenal medulla. We have two adrenal medullae, one that's on top of the right kidney, and we have another one that's on top of the left kidney. So this is another area where the sympathetic preganglionic neuron and the sympathetic postganglionic neuron can synapse. So this is scenario number five. And what I've done is I've illustrated the adrenal gland once again, so we have the outer adrenal cortex and the inner adrenal medulla. And we are specifically talking about the adrenal medulla in which we find these highly specialized chromaffin cells, which at the end of the day is classified as a sympathetic postganglionic neuron. And once these chromaffin cells are activated, they will secrete hormones that will directly go into blood. And these hormones are epinephrine, or epi, and noroepinephrine, or NE. Incidentally, epinephrine was formally referred to as adrenaline, while noroepinephrine was formally referred to as noroadrenaline. And based on the percentages, you could see that the major hormone produced by these chromaffin cells found in the adrenal medulla is epinephrine and about 15 to 20% will be noroepinephrine. So the path that we're going to look at and the path that we're going to illustrate out in our fifth and final scenario is the sympathetic preganglionic axon will enter the white ramus, it'll leave through the greater splantic nerve, and eventually reaching the adrenal medulla, upon which it will synapse with a chromaffin cell. And now that these chromaffin cells are activated, they will secrete epinephrine and neuroepinephrine. And these axons of the sympathetic preganglionic neurons will bypass the ciliac ganglion, one of the collateral ganglion that's associated with the sympathetic division. So let's go ahead and diagram this out in our fifth and final scenario. So let me go ahead and highlight the lateral gray horn and the white ramus. And here is the cell body of my sympathetic preganglionic neuron. Now, only T1 to L2 will apply if we're going to the adrenal medulla. So the cell body, lateral gray horn between T1 to L2, axon leaves through the ventral root, enters the white ramus, bypasses the sympathetic chain ganglion. So the axons continue eventually bypassing the ciliac ganglion on its way to synapsing with the chromaffin cells found in the adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla is the area that I highlighted in yellow. And we are going to refer to this right here as the greater splantic nerve.
So now the chromaffin cells are activated, and what do they secrete? They will secrete epinephrine and noroepinephrine, hormones that end up circulating in blood. And once they're in blood, ladies and gentlemen, they are circulating from head to toe. So this is no longer just into a synaptic cleft anymore. This is now systemic. And this is one of the reasons why the sympathetic division has a profound effect on our body, more so than the parasympathetic division. And that makes sense because if we're doing fight or flight, we need to be ready to do fight or flight. One last thing before we wrap up this fifth scenario, keep in mind that the axon of the sympathetic preganglionic neuron is extremely long. And I hope you see why, because it's got to make its way all the way into the adrenal medulla. This is the exception. So for those other scenarios that we looked at, the axon of the sympathetic preganglionic neuron will be short. That's your default. While the axon of the sympathetic postganglionic neuron will be long. But when it comes to our fifth scenario right here, this is the exception.